Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Roberts. I'm here today to do your sexual harassment training for 2019. Woo! Yay! Okay. You're already good at it. I'm hearing a few comments. It's okay. I understand. That's how it's going to be. Uh, and I should also state that this is not how to sexually harass millennials. That was the number one question I got for most <laughs> of the show, and that's okay. I understand. Yeah, how, how to get away with things, titled Gray Areas. Okay, let's get it on. Who is that? Say his name. Henry Weinstein. Uh, so close. Harvey. You got it. Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein was really pretty much the catalyst for something that was super popular in 2018, and that was called the Me Too movement. One year ago, that was the hottest thing we were talking about. It was all over the news. Uh, there was a lot of fallout from this particular movement, okay? A lot of fallout. Al Franken, Charlie Rose, Louis C.K., Judge Moore, I mean, you name it, they all had something happen. And I could put on 20, 30, 40, 50 more pictures of people that got caught up in this movement. And the only reason we know about it is because they're famous. That's how we know about it. This isn't a bunch of people we've never heard of, okay? So this was a very popular movement, caught a lot of people up. And I just want to point out that right now there's more women in the workforce than ever before in our recorded history, okay? In 1948, 32.7% of the workforce was women. Right now, 2016, the, the last year for full figures, 56.8. Half, over half of our workforce are women. And that has changed. I mean, it's never been that way in, in the history of our culture. There are 74.6 million women in the civilian labor force. 47% of the U.S. workers are women. I understand there's a tiny discrepancy. It's tough getting those numbers together. Times progress, cultures evolve, and rights that have been historically overlooked are now starting to be exercised with quite volume. Okay, caution, women entering the workforce. Uh, my daughter is 17. You, you let your kids find their own path, right? And you just hope you've given them the tools to do it. My daughter was a Senate page. She just got back from being a page, teenage page at the U.S. Senate. She grew up a lot when she was gone out of the house for seven months. When I dropped her off in D.C., she was my little girl. And you hang in there, Tori. You go ahead and call me anytime you want. And she comes home. And she's got her now sign, her women's rights sign, her equal rights sign. She's got her red women's hat. I'm not going to call it what it is. She's got uteruses on her socks. I mean, she went and she found her voice. Right? She went and she was like, this is what I'm doing now. She stood up. I mean, I, I, I couldn't have been more proud of her. Regardless of what my own political leanings are or my own feelings of that, she found her voice, and I think that's the main difference for today's society is a lot of the women, especially the younger women, are finding their voice, and they're exercising the rights that have been kind of steamrolled. The old days. In the old days, sexual harassment was not only tolerated, but it was kind of expected. You knew that's what was going to happen. We knew it would happen and saw it as the price to be paid to not only gain advancement, but to show that we were tough enough to brush it off. That's a direct quote from my mom, okay? My mom, when she was growing up, women could do two things. You could be a teacher or you could be a nurse. That was about it. Or a model. So my mom decided to be a model. She was a swimsuit model for Janssen. What's that? <laughs> uh, pardon me, sir? A comment about my mother? Yeah, no pictures, please, no pictures. So mom decided, you know, she wanted to enter the workforce. She wanted to do something and not be a model. And so she joined the Columbia newspaper as an associate, uh, uh, the person who puts it all together. She was working her way if she wanted to be an associate editor. So she joined the workforce. And at that time, in the mid-70s, that was her attitude. We knew it was going to happen. Oh, honey, of course. But I wasn't going to let those men get the best of me. Okay? That was then. I grew up in the 70s thinking it was all about the boss chasing the secretary around the desk, right? You remember those days? So overtime work is keeping me thin. She's running away from the boss. That's how I used to associate workplace sexual harassment. Is sexual harassment in the workplace 
Is it against the law? Yes. Are you as an employer required to do something about it? Yes. What law exactly is this? And which agency oversees this? You know, in the regulatory world for bottled water, I get this a lot. Well, is that a requirement or a suggestion? That means somebody wants to do just the bare minimum. They kind of want to do just what's required. Okay, so everybody wants to know, what law is this again? What am I breaking? The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, is the people who oversee this. And, and I really, I try to stay away from reading large blocks of text, but I want you to hear exactly what they're saying, okay? It is unlawful to harass a person because of that person's sex. Harassment can include sexual harassment or unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, or other verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature. Okay, just let that lie in your brain for a second. Harassment does not have to be of a sexual nature, however, and can include offensive remarks about a person's sex. For example, it is illegal to harass a woman by making offensive comments about women in general. Let me tell you how, where I see this laying for us in a production environment. It's lunchtime. You got four workers and they're sitting in the lunchroom. They're five minutes late getting off of lunch and the manager comes in, he opens up the door and goes, come on ladies, let's get going. I, I realize times are changing, but that come on ladies, that could be viewed as sexual harassment because that manager is saying it because these men aren't working. They're not working like ladies don't work. What are we gonna do, sit around here and, you know, chicken cluck all day, ladies, let's get going. That is actually sexual harassment. I understand, so I grew up in a culture of men from Southern Missouri and that was a very common thing. Come on ladies, let's go. But I want you to be aware of that. Both victim and harasser can be either a woman or a man and the victim and the harasser can be of the same sex, of course. Although the law doesn't prohibit simple teasing, Offhand comments or isolated incidents that are not very serious. Harassment is illegal when it is so frequent or severe that it creates a hostile or offensive work environment or when it results in an adverse employment decision such as somebody being fired. Okay, a one-off comment is not sexual harassment. Okay, joking with your buddy, a one-off is not sexual harassment. Sexual harassment, where you're going to really hit your danger point when it comes to the legality of this, is when it is frequent and severe or if one of your employees reports it and you do nothing about it it can also then get very severe the harasser can be the victim supervisor a supervisor in another area a co-worker or someone who is not an employee of the employer such as a client or customer this is directly off the EEOC government website so when they think about sexual harassment and enforcing these laws these are the rules that they're following A hundred percent, if that employer, if that employee complained to you as the boss and said, I don't want to go to that stop, all they do is talk about how good my rear end looks yeah. and it makes me really uncomfortable. Yeah, so I just to point you need, out. yeah, absolutely. So you need to do something about that. Yeah, I stood up for employees and I, I was saying that I was comfortable with the customer of my employees. Good. Absolutely. And then there's lots of different ways you can go after that. But definitely if your employer comes to you and says, I don't feel comfortable at that stop. I want it off my route, blah, 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 whatever it is, you have to take that into consideration. Okay, so you are required by law to take steps to prevent and deal with harassment in the workplace by law. This isn't a suggestion, this isn't, hey, this is the right thing to do, this is the law. The E-E-O-C. That is a federal symbol. Anytime you see that federal symbol, it is the law. Period. Examples of inappropriate behavior, uh, and this is often cited in sexual harassment complaints. So they kind of gather up all their different complaints and they make a list of kind of what the top things are. Sexual teasing, jokes, remarks, questions, sexual looks and gestures. I see that a lot. Sexual innuendos or stories, sexual favoritism. 
that's something I see um, a lot of times, a lot of times people feel that they've been so left out that they kind of gang up. They get other people that also feel left out and now they're part of a group. Like, well, these men have been discriminating against us so hard, let's just make sure that the women get the work. Or the opposite. Men get together and they go, well, you know, we need to have this done, but don't give it to Tracy because, you know, I, I really need a man on this. Both are equally as bad. Pressure for dates or sexual favors. Uh, principal of the local high school one town over from us just turned in his resignation for very aggressively asking out a lady on a date nine or ten times and she said no, 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 no. Finally took it to the school board and the school board pretty much fired him. So we're not going to stand for it. We got a zero tolerance policy. That's the principal. Gifts, letters, calls, emails, materials of a sexual nature, unwelcome physical contact, touching, patting, stroking, rubbing, straight from their website. Sexually explicit visual material, calendars, posters, cards, softwares, internet materials. Uh, remember the old calendars? I mean, at the mechanic shop when I was a kid, every calendar had a lady on it. If it wasn't a landscape, it's, it's not like that. I don't see that anymore. You might see it in the corner of a tool room somewhere, but I just don't see it. Cat calls, whistlings in a demeaning manner with sexual overtones and inappropriate comments about dress or physical appearance. So, I mean, it can be anything. It could be any one of those. It could be something that's not even on there. But when they put together the list of the top complaints, that's what they came up with. What about paying women less than men for the same work? Two people doing the exact same job, but you're a woman, you're going to make a dollar an hour less. You're going to make 50000 a year less because you're a woman. That is not sexual harassment, but it falls under a different set of EEOC discrimination laws. And here's the difference. Oh, what about racial harassment? So we've talked about sexual harassment. We've talked about, uh, you know, paying women less or uh, uh, economic harassment. Now we're talking about racial harassment. Okay, I have these little things called warnings. And when you see these come up, I'm about to show you something. And it could be offensive in today's world. I'm not taking a side. I'm using it as a teaching example. Okay, it's not dirty or anything like that. But here's your warning. Harassment's unwelcome conduct based on uh, race, color, religion, sex national origin, and, and look, they put 40 or older, age, disability or uh, genetic information, harassment becomes unlawful where enduring the offensive conduct becomes a condition of continued employment, or two, the conduct is severe or persuasive or pervasive enough to create a work environment that a reasonable, reasonable person would consider intimidating, hostile, or abusive. So I know we're talking about sexual harassment. That's why you're all here. For a brief second, I want to talk about general harassment in the workplace. This can be on race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, national origin, age, disability, uh, genetic identification. Look at that. Here's your trigger warning. I want to paint this out for you. That is a blue pickup truck with a Confederate flag on the back and a pizza delivery sign on the top. This is the pizza delivery person for a small town in the south. So this person goes and delivers pizza to an African-American couple. And the African-American couple take great offense at the stars and bars that are sitting in their driveway. So they call the owner of the pizza place. Hey, I can't believe you're such a racist. I don't ever want this guy back. You know, he was looking at me funny, da 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 Driver comes back. The owner's like, listen, I got a complaint. I can't keep this. I got to fire you. I got to let you go. That guy then fire, uh, files a lawsuit against the pizza company for infringing on his rights to fly the flag. It's his freedom of expression. And the pizza company is like, no, 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 I, I realize you have that, but I also have the right to fire you if you interfere with my business and you're interfering with my business. And so it turned into kind of a three-pronged lawsuit of whose rights trump whose at that time. Okay, but if you get back to this definition, enduring offensive conduct becomes a condition of continued employment. What if I'm a African American in your water plant and that's sitting out in the employee parking lot each and every day from a guy that I work with? I can't quit my job, but it makes me really uncomfortable and I want to say something. If they come to you and say, yo, 
I just can't do it anymore. I, you you got to do something about that flag. You have to do something. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but you have to do something. If you say, oh, don't worry about it, go back to work, that means that they are stuck in that continuing employment where they just have to tolerate it. Okay, so I'm going to give you some ideas on what you can do. It's not going to burn the house down. But that's what I wanted to bring up with this trigger warning is we are starting to see scenarios, and it's a talk I'm thinking about putting together, is where do the employer rights end and the employee rights begin or vice versa. It gets a little gray quickly. Sexual harassment is real. Real. Sexual harassment is a threat to your company. Okay, we like to think E. coli is the threat to our company, and it is, but it, we do 20 different hazard analysis on our companies, but yet we don't have a sexual harassment policy. We haven't communicated anything. Sexual harassment is illegal against the law. No company is immune, not a single one. If you have human beings working for you, you're not immune. Kim and I were talking about it earlier. There are some people in this world that are just waiting for their chance to sue. Cha-ching, let the cash register ring. They're hoping they get hit by a city bus. They're hoping they get beat up by the police. They're hoping that their boss says something inappropriate because that's their chance. 2.5 million, here's your tort claim. Thank you, I'm done. Okay, your company is not immune because you're a good person. What was acceptable then is not acceptable now, period. Okay, what not to do as the employer? What not to do? Don't ignore it. It increases your risk. If you ignore it and bad things happen, then you are just as guilty as the harasser. Do not report the risk as a one-off issue. This is a mistake. You know your, your people. You know your employees. You know if it's a culture problem or if somebody was frustrated or if somebody just opened their mouth and was trying to be smart and funny and they said something stupid. You know this. But if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I got a problem, your immediate thought shouldn't be, oh, hey, don't worry about it. It, it'll, it won't happen again. Okay, so don't just immediately report it as a one-off. Uh, you can't put up a poster once and think you're done. Well, yeah, they know they can't sexually harass. I put a poster up in the lunchroom. You know, they know that. That's good. I'm glad you put a poster up, but that's not going to stop anything. Do not neglect to take disciplinary action. And I'm going to give you some examples of what you can do that does, doesn't even include firing, actually. Many companies overlook inappropriate behavior with a slap of a hand without a paper trail to show pro, uh, with, without a paper trail to show proactive measures and responses. Please keep a little paper trail. So and so has complained. What was your action? I talked to so-and-so. What was the result? We're going to do so-and-so. File it away. It really is kind of that simple. And then follow through and hope, and hope that your plan works. But what you need is that paper trail to show the EEOC that you were serious, that you've done something, that you're addressing the issue. Companies leave themselves open to legal action by not having the proper HR procedures in place. This is particularly true of small companies that may not even have an employee handbook. In light of what has happened this year, companies, both large and small, need to be ever more aware of their vulnerabilities. Uh, I work with a lot of people in this industry that don't have employee handbooks. Usually the bigger you are, the more you have one. But even if you're small, you need to have one. Because in my leadership talk, it's all about clear expectations and what you expect. And that's what needs to be in your employee handbook. And it shouldn't just be, hey, we open at 8 and call your supervisor if you're going to be sick. I mean, this is kind of your chance to lay down the law for working at your company. Organizations must treat sexual harassment and misconduct as seriously as they do other risks. One lawsuit is all it takes. And not even the lawsuit. Of course, we're worried about losing a lawsuit, but what about your reputation? You want Facebook to start blowing up about, oh, hey, I hear one of your drivers got caught, you know, da, 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 da. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a slippery slope. So where do I start? Okay, great. What do I do? I know I need to do something. What do I do? 
Where do I start? The first step is you discuss this topic in your organization and you kind of find out, is there a problem? Do we need to change things? How about we put some tumblers in place to prevent it so it doesn't happen? So grab your number two, grab your number three, grab whoever it is that are the decision makers and really have a very honest conversation with yourself and say, what do we need to change? How do we need to change? Let's instill some change. Second step, designated who employees can report situations to. Okay, so we're going to have this policy that if you feel you've been harassed, you are now going to go to uh, 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 and report it. So who can employees report to? Policy should also take into account reporting difficulties. Another mistake companies make is having a policy that tells employees to report incidents to their immediate manager. 90% of the time, it is the manager who is the problem. So it's easy to go, yeah, if you feel you've been harassed, just tell your manager. This is saying 90% of the time, it's that manager that's the one doing the harassing. So maybe you need to have kind of a, a workaround. If you feel you've been harassed, please make sure that you report it to somebody. A lot of us don't have HR divisions, uh, but it can be so, you know, an office manager. It can be anybody you designate. In smaller privately owned companies, the offender may be the head of the company. With no one to report misconduct to, there's little recourse for the employee but to sue. If you feel you've been harassed, you make sure you tell the owner. What if the owner's the one harassing? Third step, foster a culture of awareness. How do you spread the word? Okay, saying don't sexually harass is kind of like saying, hey, rain is wet. I mean, in my mind, it's like we should know that. We, we don't, we shouldn't harass, but not everyone's like us. Not everyone's got that same sort of mindset of, yeah, that's right, that's wrong. So how do you spread that word where it's more than just lip service? Do you put it in the employee handbook? Do you have yearly training? Do you have a stern talking to? How are you communicating that? Uh, when a sexual misconduct claim arrives, a company's policy is critical to how successful the employer will be at addressing it. The policy. That time where you got together and you said, well, let's come up with something, just real quick, right here. One, one sheet of paper. What's our policy for a harassment claim? That's your blueprint, how to get out. <clears throat> your policy should contain the underlined words are the important ones. A definition of sexual harassment. Examples of sexual harassment. You can even just link it to the EEOC examples. A statement that sexual harassment or harassment of any kind is prohibited by the company and will not be tolerated. That simple statement. It will not be tolerated. Information on how the claims are investigated. This is how we're going to investigate it if we do get a claim. A statement that retaliatory action will not be tolerated. That's probably the, I see that as the number one pitfall is the retaliatory actions. And a lot of times you can go, okay, you two are having a beef. You go work over there and we'll separate you. And that person you sent to go work over there goes, well, why do they get to stay there? They're the problem. Okay, so they can see that as a retaliatory measure. A statement that corrective action will be taken. Again, I'll give you some ideas on what you can do. Uh, so here are your marching orders. I want you to create a policy for your company. And I realize it's gonna look different for everybody in this room. It can fit on one page. I just want you to put a framework out there. We will not tolerate it. Examples include jokes, touching, drawings, da 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 da. Claims will be investigated. Action will be taken. Reports will be filed. I mean, it's just one page, one page, and that's your policy. You can even just call it a harassment policy because it may not just be sexual harassment you're, you're dealing with. It may be age discrimination or gender, anything like that. Develop an anti-harassment policy together with the employees, managers, and union representatives, if need be. Communicate the policy to all your employees. Make sure that the managers and supervisors understand their responsibility to provide a harassment-free work environment. Um, I see a lot of mid, I'm just going to call mid-level managers, have one foot in the employee world and one foot in the corporate world, and they try to be both. I know I tried to back when, when I was on straddling that fence, and it's kind of tough. You can't, 
Say, all right, guys, don't sexually harass, and then in your very next step, sexually harass all the guys. Like, ah, yeah, I told you not to, but blah, 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 blah. Okay, it happens all the time. It's human nature. Ensure that all employees understand the policy and procedures for dealing with harassment. New and long-term employees alike. This involves training, information, and education. I'll give you some, some ideas on how to do that. Uh, show that you mean it. Make sure the policy applies to everyone, including managers and supervisors and owners. Yes, ma'am. Please. My employment, employment environment doesn't have it. However, we deal with literally hundreds of other people who, you know, be it connecting. Yeah, sure, their structures. That's something you need to factor into. How are you handling guests? How are you handling visitors? That's right. How Can I share with them what you and I talked about at the trade show yesterday? Yeah, that's okay, awesome. perfect. I'll share a couple more with you, yeah. Perfect. So, because I thought it was a really good idea. Uh, you know, we can only really control what's in our house. We can only kind of control our employees, and what happens on our property. And we don't have, we have a lot less control when we go visit someone else's property. Um, and one of the things we talked about yesterday is, what if I'm sexually harassed when I'm visiting another company from them? You know, they don't know me, maybe they're offhanded remark, or maybe it's a, maybe they're trying to cut you down. And so my advice is if you encounter this kind of out in the field, and it, it's to the point where you need to say something, you need to say something straight up. And again, that gets back to those leadership principles of having clear expectations. So if I'm sitting here and I'm, if I'm auditing your company as an auditor, I walk in, this isn't my house, I'm doing the audit, do, 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 do. And somebody says something to me and it's really sexual harassment. De -de -de -de. You look, personally, this is me. I look right at him and I go, boy, that's some serious sexual harassment there. I think you need to recheck your policy. And then I move on and I keep on going down the audit. That, that's me and how I handle it the first time. I cut a lot of slack for people. I like to think people are inherently good and that people aren't really kind of bad in their blood. And sometimes you just need to check them and say, wow, that's some serious sexual harassment you just put on me. And oh, I, I, oh, oh, I did, oh, sorry, and you'll just scurry away. So that's an example of how you can handle it when it's not in your wheelhouse. Or if maybe your employees, maybe you wanna communicate that to your employees. That if you are at a stop and you feel uncomfortable and somebody says something to make you uncomfortable, They've got the power to go, excuse me, that's some serious sexual harassment. Okay, please sign the bottom of your bill. You'll have a different driver next month. So again, we can only control what's in our wheelhouse. Okay, but your clear expectations need to come through. Porn, yeah. Well, in the 21st century. You know, and again, that is not within my norm. No. And let me ask you. brought it to my boss's attention. Good. Do you think that person who owned the computer or who turned on that porn, do you think they knew you were on the other line, that you were mirroring? Yeah, right, right. So I was very clear about what I was doing and that I was going to be on their computer. And I said, I see every, I think I'm missing, so I can see everything you're seeing right. before anything happens. So listen, something I tell everybody. a couple different scenarios. I can see someone like, I shouldn't say my dad, but I mean somebody of that generation, even my generation to a certain degree, not quite connecting the dots that your remoteness is going to see my hidden dirty laundry. Okay, again, I like to think everybody's good. But I could also see someone going, oh, she's on? Watch this, dude. I'm gonna open this up, watch this. She's gonna freak out. 
that is over the top harassment. Right, and, and when I'm not on the phone with them at that moment, I don't know which one of those right. is. But I know either one of those is inappropriate. Right. I hear you, if, and I just want to say this, if you went digging through the computer, that would be different. But if you just went to your normal operating files to do exactly what your contract stated you were going to do, again, just like saying, hey, that's some serious sexual harassment, maybe you need to check your training again. If that happened to me, and I was remotely working on somebody's computer, and all that sort of stuff started coming up, I would say something. And I go, do you realize you just showed me a porn movie? I mean, I, I call them on the phone immediately. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do. But there's no second chance. What did I end up doing? At that point, I stopped what I was doing. I got to my boss because I couldn't get back on the phone with them. And I got to the majority of our support people were women. Yeah. Right. But I said, this is, this is, you know, I mean, I can't get him back on the phone to say stop sure. this. Sure. Hey, you know, and we just went through a definition where the harassment part is a continuation. But in that particular instance, that one-off is pretty severe. There's no gray area. Like, did I just get sexually harassed? I mean, if, if you're working and a porn comes up, yeah. So, again, I would take it with a grain of salt, and I would just look at the totality of the circumstances and say, who am I dealing with on the other side? Are, you know, are they aware? Do they know what's going on? Perfect. Also, email them so that they will get this material. Good. Good. That's that's. Absolutely, and, and there's designated people that can take that and handle it. Clear expectations. Your boss laid down the clear expectations. My uncle recently moved into an assisted living facility. He got to be that age. The assisted living facility calls me five days after he moves in and goes, your uncle's new here, but he can't hang those kind of posters in his room. And I went, what? And I know my uncle. He doesn't do that. I was like, what? And so I went down and I visited him. And he's, he's very old and his mobility has got one of the other assisted living gentlemen, because they all hang out together, had tacked a Playboy centerfold behind his head on the wall. So my uncle couldn't even see it. He couldn't turn around like, go, oh, look at that. So he just sat there until the, the nurses or the assistants came in to help. And they were like, uh, Chuck, you can't have that on the wall. Chuck had no idea, but it was the call from their supervisor, whoever saw it, complained to their supervisor and said, Chuck's got some nasty pictures on his wall. They called me immediately and said, that's not allowed, period. You need to come get him down. And so I, I pointed it out to Chuck. He was like, oh, that Floyd, he's playing a joke on me. And Floyd's laughing all the way down the hallway. OK, you know, it's old guy jokes on each other. Point is, they had clear expectations when they called me. And they said, this is not allowed, nor will it be allowed in the future. OK? I don't want to write a policy. I just told you to sit here and write a policy. It's on one page, and it addresses this and this and this and this. I don't want to do that. You know how much paperwork I got to do? Tough. I don't really care. Failure to adopt a sexual harassment policy could be detrimental to the employer in any investigation or litigation. If you don't have a policy, you're guilty. Sorry. The absence of a policy could be used as evidence that the harassing employee and apparent, and apparent authority uh, gave them the authority to engage in this uh, misconduct uh, finding that could trigger employer liability. The employee can say, no one told me I couldn't do that. Again, we like to think, hey, isn't this just common knowledge? Don't we all just know not to sexually harass? But there's going to be employers who go, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't. I never signed a piece of paper that said I couldn't. Oh, I can't do that? Okay. If the employer is not taking all reasonable steps to prevent and deal with harassment in the workplace, the employer may be liable for any harassment which does occur, even if unaware that the harassment is taking place. If you don't have a policy and you get a million dollar lawsuit against you and you go, I had no idea. No one told me. 
tough. Sorry. That no one told me is not an excuse in court. Okay, so we need to be proactive, and you can't do it all by yourself. You have to designate people that can help. Another way to help prevent problems is to look for problematic behavior patterns. Oh, I love this. Review social media accounts, if allowed, and see if the individual's behavior outside of work could suggest a problem within the workplace. Remember how we talked about where does the employer rights begin and the employee rights end? Uh, the, the stars and bars on the pizza delivery truck. Warning. Anybody recognize that picture? That was pretty popular. That was something called the Unite the Right Rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. I think it was Virginia. Uh, very late 2017, early 2018 last year. Media really took this one particular picture and ran with it. And here's what the media sees. A bunch of white guys with tiki torches standing in front of the Virginia State Courthouse or the Virginia State House having a Unite the Right rally. This was later called the Racist Rally. So people on the other side of this issue got together and they did something called doxing. D-O-X-X. -X. They doxed them. D-O-X-X means when somebody releases your personal information on the internet in an effort to make bad things happen to you. That's called doxing. And some states are actually dr drafting legislation where it's illegal to dox people. So this gentleman became the poster boy for the KKK. Antifa, a lot of people got online. They found out who he was. They found out who his employer was. This was 7 o'clock on a Friday night. He's not at work. He's down there with all of his other buddies with tiki torches. They found his employer, and they called his employer, and they said, how in the world can you employ a racist like that? I'm never going to do any business, and you are just as bad as him. 24 hours after he was doxxed, Ryan Roy has been terminated. 48 hours. He went to this rally on a Friday night, and by Monday, he was fired from his job. <clears throat> uh, wait, I go to something that's not on work time, and I get fired from work for it? Uh, I mean, it just kind of hurts my brain to wrap my head around it. Wearing my work uniform. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you in your work van. But then again, as the employer, and I get customers calling me, going, yo, Jason, I didn't know you were in the KKK. You go, well, I'm not in the KKK. Well, your employees are. I didn't know you had a racist working for I don't have any racist. Oh, sure you did. He was at the rally. Ugh. Okay, but now the employer is getting doxxed. Not only is this person, hey, everybody, his name is Ryan Roy, and he works over at Contempo Lending. Let's all call, and here's the phone number, and here's the address. Let's all leave a billion bad Yelp reviews on Contempo Lending. And the owner of Contempo, and I'm just, that's I'm making, making it up. The owner of Contempo Lending now has a real pickle. They've been doxxed for something they didn't do. Well, what do you do? It was called Unite the Right. Uh, go ahead, bud. Thank you, yes. Exactly. Yeah, there, there was a lot of really bad energy that came from this, and it ended up with somebody driving a car through a large group of people. <laughs> That's a different talk, unfortunately. So doxing, uh, where do my rights begin? The harassment, okay? Yes? So uh, in Oregon, they, they um, have a, that employment at will law which says that you can fire or quit any job for any reason. That you can fire anyone for any reason? Yep. That, that's not. Gotcha. What if your employee says, oh, you're firing me because I'm 50? No, we're firing you because uh, we're making a PowerPoint 
perfect. And I've documented it. That's right. Yeah, because they're going to go straight to EOCC or whatever the you know uh, state version of it is, and say they fired me because I just turned fifty. And they want young kids that they could pay less or pay less money to. And EC is going to get a hold of Daryl. Daryl's going to no. According to my records, we fired him because he's been caught stealing three different times. And we talked to him the first time, and we talked to him the second time. We told him the second time if it happens again, you're getting fired. And then here it is on black and white. Oh, okay, never mind. So good, please just do the right thing, have a little paper trail. Risk management should also keep a watchful eye on the culture and their organization, not be afraid to push for changes. Sometimes it's okay to pull a couple of weeds, but if they keep growing back, there's a problem with the soil. So what do I do if someone says they've been harassed? Here we go. What do I do? Okay. Uh, Mark came to me and said he was harassed by Jim, sexually harassed by Jim. Two men. It's time for action. Let's get it on. Pull out that one-page policy. So you investigate. Okay, what happened? This side, that side. What happened? I mean, if you want to put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and have a little clipboard, that's fine. But as the boss, whatever your position, it's your job to investigate. The employer must make a prompt, thorough investigation to determine whether harassment has occurred. There's only kind of a yes or no. I suppose there could be a gray area. But it's your job to investigate. And you don't have to just take what you're told as gospel. Maybe one employee is trying to get the other one in trouble and there was no harassment at all. That's where your investigation comes in. What happened? find different witnesses, however, however that looks out. The employer should take detailed statements from the complaining person, the alleged harasser and witnesses, determine if allegations are supported by the investigation. It's up to you. You know your people better, you know your situations better, you know your customers better than I do. You investigate, is it true? All steps of the investigation should be thoroughly documented. Employers may wish to consult an attorney for assistance with harassment investigations. Don't be afraid to reach out if it's out of your wheelhouse and you're not comfortable with it. So yes, I've determined that harassment did occur. Yeah, Jim totally fessed up to it. He thought it was funny. They all slapped their guts laughing about how hard the other guy was uncomfortable. He was in tears. The employer must take immediate and appropriate corrective action, which means doing whatever's necessary to put a stop to the harassment. That's really the crux of the biscuit here. We want to do something that will put a stop to the harassment. That's our, that's our real end goal here. Depending on the severity of the harassment, appropriate corrective actions could include any of the following. So here's where you get some, some options. Yes, harassment did happen. Well, then you need to fire them. Eh, there's some things that we can do other than firing people first off. We can't do a verbal or written warning. Again, we're making a paper trail, we're putting it in their file, it's there in case we need it in the future. We've investigated, we've done something, we've issued a warning. We can offer counseling. We can bring a counselor into the workplace and sit the two of them down. We can do it one-on-one, -on -one. we can do counseling. We can do a suspension. Sensitivity training or education on harassment laws and appropriate workplace conduct. Okay, retrain that employee. That's something you can do. You've investigated it, you've made action. Uh, reassignment of workers to different locations or shifts. Totally doable, but just remember, you don't want to look retaliatory. Like, oh, I believe you, but not you, so you need to go clean coolers and you can stay here on the line. So, okay, so that's okay, you can, you can break them up, but just make sure it's not retaliatory. Uh, dismissal of the harasser, you're fired. It's that simple. You signed your employee manual at the very beginning and it said, I will not sexually harass under threat of termination and you harassed, and here's your termination, okay? Document everything, everything, even if it's just a thought, document it. So enforcement does not need to be complicated. The right corrective action is whatever it takes to make it stop. That's the right course of action. Document everything. The subject cannot be a small mention in the employee handbook that is read once and forgotten. We wanna make this a culture. 
a culture at our workplace. How do we do that? How about posting something so it's visible 24 seven? Okay, I told you posters in the lunchroom won't work. Posters in the lunchroom will work. I know, what's up Jay? It won't work once off, you go, hey, well I had a poster in there that's 20 years old, I can't believe they didn't read it. But if you put a brand new poster in there and you kind of dovetail it, you do multiple touch points, hey, remember we can't harass, and we talked about that in our employee handbook. Remember we can't harass, and we've got a big poster on the wall saying that. Remember we can't harass, we actually talked about that during one of our team meetings. Sexual harassment is against the law. This is a poster. I think I got the price on there. Should you include sexual harassment expectations in your yearly training? Yeah. Uh, this poster is on Amazon.com and I believe it was $9. Generic, straight from the EEOC. What, what do you mean you didn't know? You sit next to that poster every day at lunchtime for the last five years. You can't tell me you didn't know that. Okay, so should you include sexual harassment expectations in your yearly training? Look at this training. GMP training, allergen training, food safety training, product and site security training, job specific training, sexual harassment training. Ugh. I don't want to do all that training. That's just too much. Tough. Okay, seriously, tough. Is it unrealistic to expect a food processing company to train their employees at least once a year? Come on. Once a year. We do a GMP training. We do a security training. Throw in a sexual harassment training. Please, for your company's sake, for your sake, you're just doing the right thing. Spread the word. Be an evangelist. Okay, takeaways. I want you to develop a policy. You don't need to rewrite a book. You don't need to research 20 different things on the internet. I just want you to put it on your head and have a policy. Who, what, when, where. Promptly investigate and deal with a complaint. You don't have to fire somebody. You've got options. But the first step is you have to investigate it and see if it's true. Now remember, I'm just talking about your house. The things you can control at your company. Appropriately discipline employees who harass other people. That's the action. Okay. I think my kids have learned when I'm all bark and no bite. And I think your employees might know that about you too. Sometimes a little bit of actual discipline really wakes people up. Provide protection and support for the employees who feel they are being harassed. That's part of your family. They need some support from you. Take action to eliminate discriminatory jokes, posters, graffitis, emails, and photos at the work site, at work. Um, you know, I want to lose weight. It's pretty easy. I don't eat Snicker bars, right? I cut out all the, the sugars. But there's, that, that's just one easy thing to cut out. What I need to cut out is all, you know, go, eating before bed and all that stuff. I mean, I'm looking at the low-hanging fruit, as I call it. So, take action against the low-hanging fruit, the stuff that's totally obvious. Um, monitor and revise your policy and education information programs on a regular basis to ensure that it's still effective at your workplace. Someone has to take the lead on this. I'm looking at a lot of business owners in this room, okay? You have to take the lead on that. Yep, to our newest guy, I love it. Uh, so go nail this down, focus on your next task, address this, get it out of the way, and then I want you all to go out there and make some money selling water, okay? Any questions?